And this year, the committee said, no, 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 do that in worship. Let's do that for everybody. For some of you, you've heard this a lot. For others, this may be the first time you have heard a walk through scripture that was not corrupted by translations that reflect hate and bias. But here's how the story goes. The story of God, the Bible, and gender identity. In the beginning, God created light and dark and everything in between. A few days later, God created day and night and everything in between. It doesn't say and everything in between, but we've seen it, right? It's out there. It doesn't go, it's morning, poof, it's night. There's in between. We see it and we know it's true. A few days later, God created people, male and female, and everything in between. Years later, God sent some messengers to try to build relationship with people directly to this couple named Abraham and Sarah, a good gender-conforming couple all their lives. Abraham welcomes in these visitors who tell them that they will be receiving a miracle baby because they're in their 80s. This isn't supposed to happen. Sarah laughs at the news, but follows her role and prepares a great meal. Abraham insists that the visitors stay the night, expressing the cultural focus on hospitality, that core belief of theirs that we will take care of others because we were also once strangers in a strange land. The visitors stay the night, they give a blessing, and they discover that these are messengers from God among them. The next morning, Abraham takes them out to the hillside and says, if you go down that way yonder a while, you're running to the next town. My nephew Lot lives there, he'll take care of you. See where this story's going, right? It's the town of Sodom. Lot welcomes them in, gives them shelter and food, just like his uncle Abe had done, just like his aunt Sarah. Catch is he was new in Sodom and they didn't like visitors. They preferred to think that a great big wall separating them from other people was a good idea. <laughs> I don't know what y'all are laughing at. <laughs> he welcomes them in even though he's not lived there long enough to legally do it. So of course the people who run the town come and who are these people that are with you? We want to know who they are. Bring them out to us. And he says, no, 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 I think you might hurt them. I've seen what you and your big wall do to people. No. They threaten them. God helps. They make it out. And somehow we decided that story was about sex. Young somewhere is going, yep, been telling you all forever. It's all about sex with you people. Even when we hear a Bible story that has nothing to do with it, we somehow make it about sex. Later on, Ezekiel and other prophets would say that Sodom's sin was corruption, the lack of hospitality, and a meanness to those who are most vulnerable around them. But we decided we know more than the prophets. It's about sex. Years later, God's people got stuck in the wilderness. God wanted a relationship, but God's people had an issue with commitment. So they prayed around with other gods, and they got themselves in trouble. God brought them out of slavery in Egypt and into a wilderness. Not knowing what to do in the wilderness, having been people living in this social structure for a long time, God gave them a wilderness survival guide of 613 best practices. Rules, we call the first 10 commandments and try to put them on courthouse steps for some reason. But there's 613 of these suckers to help you do two things. One, be a community with identity and be a community that is hygienically safe and takes care of the individual so that you are a well person, especially living multiple generations through a wilderness. Really good advice for keeping a million people alive for a few generations, right? Things that were in here included advice on sacrament, on sacrificial practices, worship, things we would do as a community to connect us, to give us an identity, because of more even than your health, you need to feel like you belong to something if you're going to survive. And they did. And within those practices is the heart of a lot of Jewish culture still today. The other thing in that is hygiene. Things like don't tattoo yourself. Those needles can get you infected. Don't eat a lot of pig. Their hooves carry a lot of bacteria. Some very practical things. You're out in the wilderness, so make sure you don't worry about fancy clothes and jewelry and stuff. Keep it simple. Really practical, good advice. These things included food, it included inter 
interaction with each other. It included hygiene. It also happened to suggest that you should have lots of babies. Lots of babies. The best way to deal with a high birth, a high death rate is a high birth rate. Makes sense, right? It's simple math. So God suggests keep having babies, stay personally healthy, communally connected, and do what you can. The list of rules, the list of rules we got has now somehow been whittled down through a church hand-selected few that includes don't lie with a man as you would a woman. It's good advice if you're trying to make lots of babies, but now we've got plenty in the world. If you've seen the statistics, we've got more than we need. We're doing all right. We seem to be okay now with self shellfish. We seem to be okay these days with multiple fabrics. Any of you bought one of the 50-50 cotton polyester t-shirts from us, I hope you're okay with it. <laughs> For some reason, we got caught up on the one that has to do with what? Sex. Yeah. So many years later, many, many years, Paul is now teaching about Jesus. Jesus has come, done his ministry, and I can skip over that because Jesus didn't have squat to say about this other than love your neighbor, right? So Paul is the next one that we mess with in Scripture. He gives these boundary rules for those going to the country club. It sounds a little odd, but it's really what it was. The pagan temples is where business got done. It's where people hobnob. It's where they schmoozed. They would go to the luncheons there, kind of like Rotary or Kiwanis or the Elks. But they would stick around for the sacrificial meals and the sex because, you know, we're obsessed with it still. Paul, in his writing to churches, says, listen, I understand you got to do business, and that's where business is done. You can't close a deal without going to the golf course. I totally get it. But when you go to the golf course or the country club, just don't eat the meat that they sacrifice to the idols and don't have the sex. Now, the sex in the pagan temples had a few different sides to it. Some of it was pay to play. It was prostitution, and that's what paid for the temple's practices. Some of it was same-gender intimacy. None of it loving. Sometimes it was with young pre-adolescent boys. Sometimes there weren't enough women around. Some of the women didn't want to subjugate themselves to that, but pre-adolescent boys seemed okay. Paul had a problem with that, don't we all? Paul says, no, no, no. You can't eat the food to the idol. Don't stick around for the sex, and what they're doing to the boys is bad. There wasn't a word for it back then. Paul created a compound word, and it basically referred to sex that involved power dynamics that were unfair. That same word has been translated like 120 different ways throughout history. It's never been used to mean homosexual, same gender, or loving relationship. It's actually been used to describe husbands who forced their wives to have sex. But somehow, somehow, we decided Paul was only talking about same-sex couples and we mistranslated it. Mistranslated, it almost sounds like an accident. They chose to change the translation about 200 years ago. If you look in old English Bibles, even modern English Bibles, you won't find the word homosexual, you will find the word sodomite which tells you we've been screwing with that story for a long time in wrong ways, but it's still not about sex. And it's definitely not about the love we know about. All right. To clarify, in the beginning, God created and called it all good. Then God wanted to be a relationship with all of us, but we got cranky about inclusion. Jesus preached about love and grace of everyone, but we decided we knew better. God's story was about love. Love is patient. Kind does not insist on its own way. It bears all things. Love never ends. But the story got hijacked by hate. Hate demands immediacy. Attention now and its own way. Hate is hurtful and divisive. And hate leaves us lonely in the end. So we have to reclaim the story. We have to reclaim the church. Now some of us, many of you, have been hurt by church. It'd be easier just to give up on it. I can't blame you. But you walked in today. You walked in today, so your hope is not completely gone. Maybe you found a church that felt safe for you. Maybe you're willing to give God one more chance. Maybe you're willing to give God's people one more shot at this. Or maybe you came with a community nonprofit and felt like you should be in worship to be quiet. Either way, I'm fine with it. It's time to reclaim our story and reclaim church. 
Church is bigger than our Sunday gatherings. It's bigger than the social club with the band that's done in the name of Jesus in a big box. Church is bigger than the things we have attached to it. Church is what happens when a stranger stops on the road to help someone else, and they both realize something bigger is present with them. Church is what happens when you forgive a family member and something inside you changes. Church is what happens when love binds two people together, and together they are more than they ever imagined alone. Church is a word for a place where God is present among people, and we have to stop limiting it to our walls and our organizational NGO structures. Church is a word for a place where God and people meet. Now, there are plenty of bad examples. <laughs> plenty of bad examples. Many of you have been in them. Some of us left them. Some of them left us. There are plenty of bad examples. But you only need one. One good example is all you need. A place where you believe you are welcome. All you need is one good example of a church, of people who will let you be a part of their story and remind you that you're already part of God's story. Church is what happens when we let other people into our faith journey, and you only need to find one. Whether you are coming out or you are just overcoming the struggles in your own life, church can happen in the most unexpected places. When it does, when it does, I only ask one thing. Tell the story. <laughs>